This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Jonathan Bennett and I are talking with Jason Donenfeld of WireGuard, one of the most important protocols for VPNs in the world. And that's coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 626, recorded Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. WireGuard and Open Source VPN. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Technology Powers X. Learn how technology is reshaping business through an original podcast from Dell Technologies. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. And by Hover. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Good morning, good evening, or whatever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. Welcome to another one of these. And I'm joined this week by Jonathan Bennett himself. So where I... I <laughs> uh, hey, Doc. You have a new setting there. You have a new setting. I don't know whether you're in a different place, but it looks cooler. Well, it looks very official. It, yeah, I've, I've actually, I've been slowly working on this for, for months now. Um, it's the same place, uh, but I've built some cabinets behind me and a built-in desk, and then I've upgraded to a DSLR and do an HDMI capture off of that. And so, yeah, I've, I've definitely been working to try to up the game, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied <laughs> with how it's turned out. And you've, you've got your don't mess with me chair, which, knowing how <laughs> tall you are, must be one really big chair. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big chair. Um, I, one of the companies I worked with, the the guy that owned it came down with uh, I don't remember what it was. It was a, some form of cancer, I believe. I think he, I think he's got it under control. But anyway, uh, part of the deal with getting treatment for the cancer is he had to get a new chair because this one suddenly was very uncomfortable for him. And they were like, "Hey, we've got this really nice office chair. None of us want it. Do you want it?" I'm like, mm -hmm, "Yes, I will definitely take that. It's great." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very cool. So you're still in Oklahoma, even though you have space uh, on your screens in the background. Yes, I I, I've thought about that. I need to I need to get some kind of real clever uh, background on my screens behind me, maybe hang some artwork <laughs> above them. But yeah, I'm still here in Southwest Oklahoma. Yeah, and I normally I'm in Santa Barbara or New York, and um, and right now because I wasn't planning on this, but I am in Hawaii at the South Shore in. Uh, uh, I don't know, Poipu Beach, which is in Kaloa, uh, on, on the island of Kauai, uh, which from time to time, it's just dawn here right now. And you're hearing maybe if the mic is picking it up, um, uh, chickens crowing in the background, roosters crowing in the background. I, Kauai is designed in such a way that um, no human being is ever out of sight or sound from a chicken. Uh, there are wild chickens all over the place. So that's a feature here. Anyway, so that's, uh, so that's great. So are, are you've actually, uh, co-hosted or hosted, um, with our guest before, uh, uh Jason. I, I'm pretty right? sure. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't actually take the time to go back and listen to it again. I'm pretty sure I co-hosted with Randall. Uh, so it's been, you know, a couple of years ago now. Um, and this was, this was back before, uh, before WireGuard was in mainline Linux kernel, and that was one of the big things we were talking about then, is they were still pushing to uh, uh, to get it mainline so that you know it was much simpler for everybody to use. So it's it, the project's come a long way since then. Well, that's great. We're, we're going to hear a lot more about that. But first, I have to let you know that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Technology Powers X an original podcast by Dell Technologies. Each episode of Technology Powers X focuses on a different industry and goes behind the scenes to help you understand how technology is reshaping business everywhere. Um, I've got a sneak preview of it, and it's really terrific. I really love the fact that uh, a podcast sponsors a podcast. Uh, a recent episode, for example, features researchers who are studying the architecture of the human brain in an effort to develop more versatile AI models. Another 
explores the world of professional esports, featuring a behind-the-scenes look at Team Liquid and their star uh, CSGO player, uh, Alige. Um, and another episode talks about vertical farming and how innovative new tech can change where our food comes from and how this may be the future of sustainably feeding 21st century populations. Technology Powers X is hosted by Danielle Applestone, a hardware engineer and entrepreneur. If you're a pet lover, check out episode 14, The Best Partner for Pets. And here is a clip. Yet today, technology plays a growing role, not just in happy reunions, but as an invaluable tool to America's animal welfare workers. So search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. That's Technology Powers X. Download it today. My thanks to Technology Powers X for their support. Uh, so, Jonathan, um, before we get to our, our guest today, we have uh, some news that you've paid a special attention to. So let us, let us have a bit on that. Yes. So... Uh I he, people that have followed me for a while may know I'm kind of a space nut among other things and NASA has not very long ago landed um Perseverance on Mars and you know with when they put a rover like that on another planet there's a whole bunch of sub experiments you know little tools and things that are attached to the rover that get deployed one of the things that got deployed is Ingenuity which is a, a helicopter and it's the first time that a helicopter has ever flown on another planet. But it's also the first time, as far as I know, it is the first time that NASA has used Linux or even, as far as I know, anything open source in one of their, um, in one of their probes, in one of their projects. Uh, and it, it's... Normally, they run something like a, a real-time operating system. You know, one of the one of those options, or maybe something they've written themselves. But because Ingenuity is what they call a, um, it's like a test bed for new hardware. They have a higher uh, higher acceptable risk, and so when the people put it together, they pitched running it with Linux, and NASA was like. Okay, let's see what happens. So it's it's really, and that was a couple of days ago that it, it actually flew for the first time successfully. You know, it went up a few meters and then went back down. And of course, they're going to review all of that data. But it, it's a bunch of firsts. But uh, Linux running on another planet, that's thats a pretty cool first. Yeah, Earth is not enough. Uh, yeah, Earth is, <laughs> is unsatisfactory <laughs> for us. That is very cool. You're showing that, that we're showing for those watching on video that's there. And I like on... Uh, on Hackett Day, which is your uh, site, uh, the the headline, the right stuff, as in the Wright brothers. Uh, that that's very cool. So, our guest today um, uh, is Jason Donafeld. He's a security researcher, cryptographer, kernel developer. Spent the last decade and a half writing exploits for the lowest level of operating systems. He created WireGuard, uh, following lessons learned by his experience at breaking things. He single-handedly changed the VPN protocol landscape with WireGuard, which has been adopted by several operating systems, including recently the Linux kernel, which is what we care most about. So welcome, welcome, Jason, to, to Floss Weekly. Thanks. Happy to be here. There, there, there he is. So, so um, let's just, just get started by telling us a, a little more about WireGuard, especially catching us up from where you and Jonathan talked about uh, uh, last time on the show. Sure. So I guess for, for people who didn't catch the last show, which was maybe three years ago, I think, um, we should probably dive into what WireGuard is. Uh, and then we can, can talk about what's changed since then. Um, so WireGuard is, in the basic sense, just a secure networking tunnel. It connects uh, one network to another network in some secure, encrypted way. Um, that has all sorts of uses, like uh, uh, VPN usage, um, uh, just trying to merge networks together. Um, it's used in enterprises, used for commercial VPN providers, <clears throat> used by people just doing uh, ordinary hobbyist things, used for IoT, all, all sorts of different uses for this core building block of a secure network tunnel. Um, and so it's not a particularly new idea. Uh, network tunnels have been around for a long time, but um, in the past they've been very complicated or they've shipped with 
tons of additional features or uh, mechanisms that made things really very bloated. Um, whether it's uh, complicated uh, key distribution schemes or um, uh, or network configuration uh, daemons inside of the network tunnel, uh, there's just been so many other things added uh, that really resulted in code bases that were not very secure. Um, uh, massive footprints and and the amount of code, uh, but also just uh, features that cause problems, that cause logical issues. Uh, so WireGuard kind of took the lessons of these these past bloated protocols, and um, it's really a, a extremely minimal new take on the old idea of a secure network tunnel. So with WireGuard, you just get a basic tunnel that you can use for building things like VPN um, and a, a clear API for for uh, modifying the tunnel where there's usually just one way of doing things. Um, and out of this, people have built all sorts of different things and integrated them into different projects and products and so forth. Um, but WireGuard itself is really just focused on being this kind of core internet infrastructure building block component. Um, nothing too big, uh, but still um, functional enough that it's it's useful. Uh, it's interesting to me that um, some of the most uh, useful and profound things uh, are very modestly presented. I remember in the very early days of Linux, uh, uh, Linus saying, no, it's just another <laughs> Unix. It's just another, uh, it's got POSIX compliant. If it does POSIX, it's kind of, you know, uh, it's it, very modest, you know, and of course we've gone an awful long way from there. Um, so, so what kind of security design principles are you basically embodying in here that make it distinctive? Uh, so there are a couple things. Um, and to start with, WireGuard um, is easily auditable. Um, and... Uh, we do this by keeping the code base uh, really as, as small as possible. It's been a while since I looked up at code counts, but at some point the number was you know less than 4,000 lines of code, something around there. Um, and the idea is that anyone can kind of open up the WireGuard source code and read it in the afternoon. Um, there, there's often this idea thrown around of you know, many eyeballs. If you have something that's open source, people will look at it with many eyeballs and find the bugs and it'll get more secure. But the problem is some of these code bases are so massive that um, people don't really want to read that much code. Uh, it's just not enjoyable. People's eyeballs don't actually go to doing that because, I, I, I mean, why why would they? It's just so much work uh, with, with other things. Um I mean, when you look at, say, IPsec, um, uh, we're talking the, the keying daemon is like 400,000 lines of code, and the kernel part is another 100,000 lines of code. Uh, when you look at OpenVPN, I mean, it does so many things. You have so much code, you know, 100,000 lines of code, plus it needs OpenSSL for uh, a bunch of the other crypto protocol parts, um, and, and so on. I mean, these other things are just so large. Uh, so WireGuard was really focused on... Um, how can we design a protocol that um, is able to be implemented in not that much code? Tight code, but still not that much code so that people actually will want to read this and will read it. And when they do read it, they'll have success in understanding it in order to uh, actually assess it. So uh, that was the first big thing. Um, we, we also wanted to have a, a real simplicity of the interface where you just have a normal network interface, no um, fancy daemons to spin up, um, no uh, complicated in-band communications, but just you add a network interface. And then the usual sysadmin things that people know about uh, already for administering Linux machines could be used for WireGuard. So you don't really have to learn anything new and doesn't present semantics that are um, that are too much different. And um, uh, this is accomplished through a bunch of things we can get into later if you want. Uh, there's a concept called crypto key routing. There's um, uh, there's a, a timer system. Um, uh, and, and we can go into that, but just uh, more, I guess, more on the security design principles. Um, 
as 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 you mentioned, Doc, um, I, I come from a background of of, of breaking things, and um, uh, <laughs> usually in network protocols, I see the same types of bugs over and over again. Um, things kind of fall apart in the same way, and and one of them is complicated parsers. Um, like ASN1 for, for parsing X5 and I certificates, for example, or uh, variable length fields. Um, it seems like in lots of protocols, you have um, things that make sense on paper for protocol designers, you know, very clever techniques of encoding data. But when it comes down to actually implementing a parser for that, things go horribly because it winds up being kind of complex. So in WireGuard, um, there are static fixed length headers. So uh, all packet headers have fixed width fields, so you don't need to need to parse anything. And I, I mean, it's a it's a little bit simplistic, but you know, if you have no parsers, then you have no parser vulnerabilities. So just kind of an entire class of vulnerabilities go away. And similarly, there are always lots of bugs cropping up in, in network protocol implementations around dynamic memory allocation um, and uh, state that's too mutable. So in, in WireGuard, uh, all the state that's required is allocated in the beginning. There's no dynamic memory allocation. Um, and we also don't modify any state in response to unauthenticated packets. Um, and, and so kind of just already a big, um, a big class of vulnerabilities disappear. It's just not something we have to worry about because it's not required to implement the protocol. Um, uh, there are some other aspects where, um, um, you know, you're never supposed to rely on security through obscurity. Um, but on the other hand, defense and depth is important. And on that basis, uh, stealth is an important principle to have. Um, and so WireGuard um, uh, kind of hides on a network. You can't scan for it. It's not chatty. So if you're not using WireGuard, um, it's hard for someone to see that it's something that you will use or that you have enabled. Uh, so you can't scan the internet trying to find all WireGuard endpoints, for example. Um, and, and, and finally, a, a huge thrust was uh, to have really solid crypto. Uh, older protocols were you know, developed in the 90s, early 2000s, and they did the best they could with the crypto that was around at the time, but um, We've learned a lot since then, um, and there's really a, 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 a huge body of work since then that WireGuard has been able to build on. So um, there's modern primitives like Curve 35519, Cha Cha Poly, Blake too, um, and so we, we get a bunch of really kind of nice uh, nice security properties out of this. Um, uh, so I, I guess later, if you want to dive into technical stuff, we can go into what properties make a, a key exchange protocol interesting. Um, but also WireGuard is opinionated, so um, there's no cipher agility. Um, there are no knobs and things for administrators to shoot themselves in the foot with. You kind of get one set of, of primitives, and if that's ever a problem, then we'll re release a new version and increase the version number. But we're not going to add a bunch of knobs for people to, uh, you know, select and mix and match. It's just simply not necessary uh, and adds, adds a lot of complexity. Um, one, of the, so, one of the iterations yeah. of Moore's law is essentially that if you give someone the ability to shoot themselves in the foot, they will. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so that, that's kind of what we've seen with these past VPN protocols where they're so complex. They have so many knobs. They do so many things that... Um, not only can the programmers not implement it properly because it's so complex, but administrators can't set it up properly because there are so many knobs and, and it falls apart. So WireGuard's focus really is on uh, extreme simplicity, minimalism, just trying to do one thing and do it well. Well, at the same time, doing enough that it's useful, that it's not just a toy. So I, there, there's so many different directions I want to go with this. I have about four questions lined up that you touched on. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's start first. Let's keep on this this question about the the security of the protocol. Uh, is is WireGuard considered to be um, quantum cryptography secure? Um, so yes and no. Um, the main key exchange uses elliptic curve cryptography, and 
ECC is broken with quantum computers, no doubt about it. Um, but WireGuard also has a, um, uh, a slot for a pre-shared key. And um, there's uh, a neat finding from Grover that says, um, uh, with symmetric cryptography, um, you basically get a square root speed up from a quantum computer. So if we use a 256-bit key, quantum computers, complexity in, in breaking that would still be as though it's a 128-bit key, which is sufficient. So we have this pre-shared key slot. And um, with that, you can then run any post-quantum algorithm you want and pop the result of that into the pre-shared key slot. Um, the idea being that um, post-quantum primitives uh, and protocols are still very new. There is still not a lot of consensus uh, uh, in the cryptography community of what the absolute best one is. The NIST competition for that is still ongoing. I mean, we're still really in the early stages figuring that stuff out. So by having this pre-shared key slot, people uh, can use the current ECC crypt that we have now, but also run any variety of different post-quantum algorithms on top of that. Uh, so I've seen some things people are doing where we'll take all of the current NIST competition candidates um, and uh, run all of those protocols at once, hash the result together and give that to the, the pre-shared key slot. Um, it could be that some years down the line where we release a, a new version of WireGuard that has this uh, baked in natively. And um, uh, there have been some papers on, uh, on uh, post-quantum WireGuard um, but I think it's really too early to be baking that kind of thing into the kernel. Um, so for now, we have this pre-shared key slot, which makes it exten extensible, um, but we're not going to commit uh, to one set of primitives now. It would be way too early for that. Sure. Uh, that that pre-shared key slot, does it, does it give you guys the ability to do an authenticate and then decrypt um, defensive stance? Uh, I know this is something that OpenVPN uh, did uh, several years ago. They added, I believe they used one of the uh, message authentication, like a, a Mac code, um, so that before you try to decrypt the packet, before you try to parse it at all, you can you can check that that, that code checks out. And so you know that whoever sent the packet knows the pre-shared key. Yeah, so what, what you're talking about is just um, a way for them to kind of harden their... Uh, their implementation against people exploiting bugs in it, where at least there's this uh, layer of very simple cryptography, just like an HMAC, before the rest of the implementation starts looking at things. Um, un unfortunately, that uh, that's symmetric, so you wind up having to share that with all the different people who are connecting to you. So that technique has some big limitations. Um, WireGuard takes a little bit different approach. Um, Every data packet, of course, uses authenticated encryption. So um, uh, there's always an off layer on every packet that's uh, encrypted symmetrically. Um, but for the key exchange itself, which is really the sensitive part that you want to protect, uh, what WireGuard does is it has a one round trip handshake where there's authentication in the first message. So there's no chance to get an, a, a response from WireGuard unless you've sent the correct packet. Otherwise, WireGuard will be completely silent. There's no, um, you know, sorry, that was incorrect uh, message that's sent back. Um, it's just silent. Uh, so it has the pretty much the same property where if you're not using the same crypto, WireGuard won't really uh, won't really even entertain what you've sent to it. Um, this is different than the pre-shared key feature I mentioned. That pre-shared key feature for the uh, uh, post quantum and other extensions um, is really mixed in. It's an extra bit of cryptographic information that's mixed in uh, to the initial handshake. Um, but uh, even without it, the, the handshake still has this nice property of um, uh, there's always authentication in the first message, um, and uh, the responder is always silent to unauthenticated crypto. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to 
to, to go back in our Discord and figure out who it was, and I'm not seeing it immediately. Someone was asking about uh, running WireGuard in a corporate network, and in many of those networks, UDP is just not allowed at all. I mean, even uh, DNS requests will have to go through a uh, uh, an invisible proxy. And uh, so he was asking the question, is it possible to run WireGuard over TCP uh, to be able to get it out through some uh, a corporate network like that? Uh, yeah, it is actually. Um, <clears throat> now, WireGuard itself is a protocol that works over UDP because WireGuard is encapsulating IP packets, layer three packets. Um, and so the datagram is the right uh, kind of analog for that kind of encapsulation. Um, you wouldn't want to natively put uh, layer three packets inside of TCP because you get terrible performance characteristics. Um, but because it is just UDP, that's also very simple to encapsulate in anything else. Um, so the naive thing uh, that some do that you could do is um, you throw it inside of a TCP stream and you prefix each message by the length of each datagram. Uh, that works, but you run into this TCP inside of TCP problem. Um, so there are other interesting projects, uh, such as uh, UDP to RAW is one, uh, but there are a couple that simply transform a UDP stream to look like it's IP, uh, sorry, to look like it's TCP, so that um, uh, so that firewalls and such let it through, but it's not actually running the full TCP state machine, so you wind up getting pretty good performance out of it. Um, and more generally, I consider that corporate network blocking um, of, uh, of non-TCP packets as really just a, a, a subset of a greater problem of, of um, uh, lots of different types of traffic is blocked. Um, you know, depending on what country you're in or what, what network you're on, um, there might be you know, deep pack inspection looking at things. Uh, and so in general, this is all a subset of <clears throat> how do you obfuscate an arbitrary stream of, of UDP packets? Um, and, um, I mean, there, there are various ways you'd make it look like TCP if that's all you need, but you might also want to make uh, your WireGuard stream look like a legitimate HTTP session. Um, uh, so there are all sorts of techniques of, um, you know, you take a corpus of HTML and you walk a Markov chain and you make uh, your traffic look like it's HTML. Um, or, you know, all sorts of ways of transforming one type of traffic to look like another type of traffic. Um, and so that's definitely possible to do with WireGuard as a layer on top of WireGuard, but it's not something that's baked in to WireGuard itself. Okay. Uh, we, we do have a question uh, coming straight from Discord. Uh, Floyd Duck is uh, trying, to, trying to wrap his mind around the, the basis of this. He says, WireGuard is a VPN endpoint, right? So I could set one up in my office in order to VPN in there. And that's, that's kind of what this is, uh, this is intended to be, right? Yeah, you can you can totally do that. You can set it up in your office, VPN to your office, and then you know start printing documents at work when you're not at work, or you know whatever you want to do. Okay, uh, and then we also had somebody, um, uh, someone who was asking. Uh, it's actually it was JoJo Dancer in the IRC wants to know about. Uh, he's asking what type of logging is this code doing? Um, is it RAM based? Once the user is gone, uh, are there footprints left? And I think he's I think he's thinking about more like a, a commercial offering. Um, how much uh, you know? What kind of a trail is left when someone is using this? Uh, is, is that something you want to speak to at all? Sure. I, I mean. WireGuard itself doesn't log traffic. Um, there's nothing to prevent a commercial provider or anyone else who sets up WireGuard from, you know, just running TCP dump on the on the system and collecting all your traffic, just as with any other traffic that transits through their computers. If they want to, they could log it. But WireGuard itself really has nothing to do with that. Um, uh, each interface has a list of public keys that are allowed to connect to it. When you send a packet to a WireGuard machine, it'll send a packet back to you. Um, and that's about it. Um, you know, it's possible to enable some debug logging uh, if you run into bugs or if you're a developer. But, uh, I mean, that's 
you know, not on. It's not even compiled into most builds of WireGuard. Um, and I, yeah, I, this, this question of logging is one that really belongs to, uh, to provider, to service providers, but the technology itself has nothing to do with logging or not logging. It's just not part of what WireGuard is. Okay, that's uh, that is a perfect answer. And then in the Discord, we, so this this is new. We have now IRC and Discord, and I'm trying to pull questions from both places. So if this is if I seem a little frazzled, that's why. Uh, but earlier in Discord, someone was asking about Cloudflare, uh, and apparently there was a, a message that I think you sent maybe back in 2019, uh, stating that Cloudflare just didn't want to have a whole lot to do with WireGuard. Is that still the case, or have they kind of gotten on board? Um. As I understand it, they kind of went off and wrote their own kind of implementation of WireGuard, but forked the protocol a little, and I think they're kind of still off doing their own thing, and I really haven't had much communication with them, unfortunately. I I wish that would have been some great collaboration, but I think they just uh, wanted to do it themselves, and that's how it goes. Question to ask, uh, but first I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Uh, it's time to make plans and let Hover help you achieve them. If you're a blogger, creating a portfolio, building an online store, or just want to make a more memorable redirect to your LinkedIn page, Hover has the best domain names and email addresses just for you. Email at your domain name is key to connecting with customers and building trust for your brand. They have domain-based emails for all your needs, small or large. It's so easy to set up. You can add as many mailboxes to your domain as you need. When your domain renews, your mailboxes will too. The prices are unbeatable. Their most popular mailbox is a no-brainer solution for business owners. You get access from anywhere. Use the email app you're already comfortable with. If apps aren't your thing, their webmail can be accessed wherever you are. Um, and I have to let you know, I'm I'm a Hover fan from way back, from long before I started uh, started here. I use them for all my domain names. I have too many of them and they actually don't mind when I cut down on the numbers. So uh, they're cool with all of that. Their customer service is fantastic. Hover isn't here to upsell you on stuff you don't need. They just want to help. They have pro-level tools. They have powerful domain and email management tools that are intuitive and easy to use, whether you're a web pro or just getting started. Uh, they're private and secure with who is privacy protection included with your domain purchase. Your private information will remain just that, private. It's a great way to reduce spam and protect yourself from unwanted solicitations. Hover Connect lets you pick the service you want and use to build and host your website. Connect helps you start using your domain name with just a couple of clicks. At Hover, you're a customer and not a source of data. Take back control of your data with reliable tracker-free email. Hover is trusted by hundreds of thousands of customers who use their domain names and email to turn their ideas into a reality. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And we thank Hover for their support. So so my my question, Jason, is uh, earlier you used the first person plural we uh, in talking about uh, something. So I'm wondering about you know, your development community. How much is all you and how much is other people? Um, how can others be involved if they aren't already? What's that look like? Um. So it's definitely not all me. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I started the project, primary developer. Um, but uh, you know, at any given time, we, we've got several developers working on different things, different operating systems, different sub projects. Um, and uh, there's an active IRC channel, WireGuard and Freenode. Um, and there's also a very active mailing list where there's uh, tons of input from the community. And, um, you know, WireGuard was developed very conservatively. Um, uh, it was marked as experimental and, you know, do not use all these scary warnings uh, for several years as, um, uh, as snapshots were published. And during that time, there's 
uh, tons of kind of feedback from interesting, uh, in- interested people. Um, uh, and, uh, so I- I'd say that development has definitely been a community process. Um, so best way to get involved, um, uh, message on IRC or, uh, an, an email to the mailing list. And, um, there's a, a plenty to do, uh, there are advanced tasks for people, there are beginner tasks, um, um, yeah, all, all sorts of interesting things going on. So, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how development itself has changed over the last few years. A, a frequent topic here um, is is how, as more stuff has become containerized and and moving farther up the stack, um, there's there's somewhat less interest on the part of many developers in doing the more low level stuff. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how that development and development communities have changed over the last few years. You're a young guy, but you're a veteran already. So I figure you have opinions on this. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, um, you know, the, the web has taken over. Um, and so a lot of new developers who might have in a different era gone into, uh, you know, desktop development or, um, which naturally then leads to lower level concerns uh, wind up doing uh, web instead, which is, you know, a perfectly valid thing. And uh, web is now an important part of our lives. But indeed, that means a lot of uh, energy uh, has has gone elsewhere. Um, and, um, and in some ways, there's not as much uh, focus on the low level things. But on the other hand, um, we now have devices everywhere. I mean, the uh, uh, just the the prevalence of Android phones means that um, uh, every one of these manufacturers needs to have kernel developers writing Android drivers uh, for the Linux kernel and so forth. So, uh, at the same time, in other pockets, you still have um, lots of people you know, learning C, doing low level things. Um, so I, I don't I don't think it's as as bleak as people predicted it would be. Um, uh, I remember about. I don't know, 10-ish years ago, people were saying, uh, oh, well, the um, the Linux kernel maintainers, they're getting old, uh, and there's you know no young blood to come around and replace them, and it's just going to die out. It's going to be terrible. Uh, but I, I'm really not concerned about that. I, I, I think we have seen a lot of uh, new developers and new blood, and there's still more than enough interest in that kind of low-level programming. So that's a that's a great segue to something I wanted to ask about. What what all are the platforms <clears throat> that WireGuard runs on now, and are there any interesting um, stories from the trenches about getting some of those to work? Uh, I I know there are, and I'll ask about specific ones if if you don't talk about them. But I'll just leave the question open ended to start with. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, we're on all the major platforms, and uh, say so each platform has its own story its own saga of how we got there um so um uh, i see you've got the cross-platform user space implementation page open indeed we have this uh implementation in go um which runs on uh, a bunch of platforms in user space uh easy to port to new platforms Uh, and it works fine um it's you know not the fastest but it's okay but really the the big um the big goal is always kernel implementation. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, the first goal was the Linux kernel, and that, that took um, some effort to get into. Um, in the first place, because when we when we got it into Linux, uh, uh, it was WireGuard was new. It wasn't anywhere before it was there. Um, so there was some convincing to be done that WireGuard was actually worthwhile. Um, uh, on top of that, there is a lot of work that went into redoing uh, the way that Linux does crypto um, and the APIs that are available. And um, initially, I had proposed a, a, a very kind of radical new uh, way of doing this new organization of files called Zinc. Um, uh, and it was just too radical. It was too much change uh, at once. So um, over the course of about a year, year and a half, uh, we wound up finding ways to do that more gradually. Um, so it wouldn't be a kind of a, 
a revolutionary change, but an evolutionary one. Um, <laughs> small pieces that could uh, gradually get things where we needed. And um, in the end, I, that process worked great. So it looks like you've got this LWN article about um, talk I did at, uh, at Kernel Recipes, I guess. Um, and uh, that's a fun talk. I, I stepped through some code examples and um, uh, kind of what motivated the project. But anyway, in the end, I think we we got to a very good place where the old uh, crypto API and the new crypto API kind of live together in harmony and everything works well there. And um, since a while now, uh, Wire has been upstream in the Linux kernel and now it's in all the distros and that's been great. Um, a little easier story uh, was... Um, in OpenBSD, it's in that kernel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a uh, developer got in touch with me uh, a number of years ago uh, uh, named Matt, and um, uh, we worked together on this implementation, did lots of code review. Um, so it's a great collaborative process. And I think it took us, um, I don't know, maybe two or three submissions if I remember correctly, to uh, the OpenB mail, OpenBSD mailing list. And, um, you know, each time there was great technical feedback. And, again, they were happy to have it. And it was pretty smooth sailing. Um, that, that was that was really a very easy experience. Um, I guess most recently, and I assume this is uh, what you were wondering about with the question, um, uh, there's been some talk around free BSD. Um, mm -hmm. So what happened here is... Um, uh, there's a firewall uh, company that um, uh, hired some outside contractor to write a WireGuard implementation for FreeBSD, and um, he didn't do a very good job. Uh, and there are tons of security vulnerabilities in what he did, and um, it was just like clearly kind of a, a half-baked um, implementation, and. Uh, um, for I, I I don't know how exactly, but I guess there wasn't that much review in the free BSD uh, community, and this half baked implementation was accepted. Um, so at some point, a free BSD developer had reached out to me, starting to look at this, and so I looked at it with him and um, pulled in the Open BSD developer too, and the three of us found all these issues. Um, uh, and it was a little bit worrying because it was so close to the release date when this was going to go out. Um, so we tried to fix as much as we could in about a week or a week and a half or so. You know, not not much sleep, just kind of going full on trying to repair this code, you know, fix the vulnerabilities. Um, we did a, a, a decent job. We we didn't get it, you know, where we needed. You know, a week or a week and a half is not enough to write a piece of secure code or to fix a, a broken piece of code. But still, it was, you know, a, a decent amount of effort. And we, um, we, we published the changes and the company that initially had, uh, had paid this contractor was uh, not very happy about um, what we had done. Um, I guess there was some question about turf or something. Um, <laughs> So th this this kind of blew up into something very uh, very unhappy. Uh, they were threatening me, and uh, it was not good. But the end result out of this, I think, was really uh, the best of ones, which is the FreeBSD security team then got involved uh, after seeing you know these people come along, fix a bunch of security bugs. They're saying it's not so good. Uh oh, what do we do as a security team? And they made the right choice, not an easy choice, but definitely the right choice which was they pulled the code out. They said, all right, code is gone. Come back later when, when this is finished, which is great. Um, because now this is being developed in the normal WireGuard process where we're doing regular snapshots. We're getting tons of testing. We're doing lots of code review and iteration. Um, and we're going back to kind of the really conservative ways that, um, that the WireGuard project has traditionally uh, developed code. And so that... That's really a big relief for me. We're not pushing the super rush thing. Uh, FreeBSD is not wound up with this half-baked code uh, from before. And I think the net result will be that for the next release of FreeBSD, there'll be a, a great first-class implementation uh, that everyone will be happy with. So um, 
there was a tense uh, couple of weeks there, but um, I think the end result was really great. Yeah. And, and what about like uh, routers and uh, dedicated hardware firewalls? Have you seen uh, have you seen very much uptick in uh, uh, implementations of WireGuard there? Yeah. So. Um, uh, lots of um, consumer routers are based on Linux, and um, uh, these, because WireGuard is now in Linux, these routers are now getting Linux, uh, which is great. And uh, same thing for ones based on you know FreeBSD and OpenBSD and such. Um, but also, um, more importantly, the OpenWRT project has supported WireGuard for a long time, and it seems like more and more. Uh, uh, router manufacturers, instead of going with their own firmware, are actually basing things off of WRT, which is very cool. Um, so these are also getting it automatically as well. Um, and then there are um, there kind of uh, router distributions like uh, you know, like ViOS, formerly Viata, um, uh, OpenSense, and such that also have WireGuard. So um, certainly, rat routers are, are are getting this as well. So that's that's actually that's really interesting. I one of the things that I've been doing uh, security research and otherwise is I just got a Starlink, and the Starlink router that it ships with, come to find out, is running OpenWRT underneath. So cool. that was interesting to me. Now they don't have any of the uh, web interface available yet, but it you know you, you you pull up its DNS and all of that, and that's what it reports itself as. So I'm. Looking forward to cracking that case and seeing if I can get a, a serial connection to it. Um, but that that brings me to a question I wanted to cover. Um, now that I have Starlink for the first time, I have native IPv6. Uh, does does WireGuard play with IPv6? Does that just work, or is that still a future feature? It, it, it just works. It's been there out of the box since the beginning. Um, it can do v6 over v6, v4 over v6. Uh, v6 over v4, v4 over v4, I mean, all the combinations. It just kind of works out of the box. All right, wow. very cool. And then, uh, in fact, I just had this whispered in my ear. Um, uh, is there a Mac implementation? Uh, it's in it's in free, it's in the VSDs. That means it's in Mac now, right? Is that how that works? <laughs> well, not quite. I think the, the, <laughs> you know, the Mac VSD fork happened a long time ago, but there is indeed a Mac implementation. Um, and an iOS implementation, and an Android one, and a Windows one. Um, I mean, at this point, we're running on all platforms. Um, so uh, it, you can use WireGuard anywhere, basically. Is the is the Mac implementation actually a, a, a kernel based, or is it just the Go user space? That's that's a user space one, and it seems like as well Apple is um, is you know cracking down on kernel extensions. So even if we wanted to write one. Um, it seems unlikely that uh, you know we'd be able to deploy it a couple years out. Um, Apple is moving uh, the VPN protocols to their network extension framework, which is a user-based framework, and hopefully they'll make that pretty fast and performant. Um, but uh, that's kind of what's been handed to us to use. Um, and the same applies for iOS. On Android, the um, situation is a little different. Uh, there is the traditional... Uh, user space uh, VPN service um, based implementation, and that's available. But for the longest time, we've also offered the uh, uh, the kernel implementation for people with rooted phones. Um, and uh, if your phone is rooted, there's actually a button in the app that will try and download a, a kernel module for your phone's kernel uh, on the fly, which which is neat. Um, in addition. Um, uh, WireGuard has been backported to the Android kernels for 5.4 and 4.19, I believe, um, which means the next generation of phones that come out with the next Android operating system will have it in their kernel. And I guess there's still a little work to be done on, on hooking that up to Java accessible APIs, but um, mm -hmm. the initial foundation has definitely been laid there. I know... This will get a little bit into the weeds, but I know that uh, not too very long. Well, it's been a while ago now. Um, I, I I was part of the 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 group that was trying to get uh, some of the open source 
uh, Android images like Lineage OS in particular to ship with WireGuard working out of the box. Did, did any of that ever come about? Did Lineage OS or has there been any sign that uh, the Android open source project is going to integrate WireGuard kind of uh, natively without even needing the app? Um, yeah, so it seems like uh, lineage maintainers have begun to add it to the lineage kernels. So um, uh, for a couple phones, um, uh, or per perhaps it's many phones now, I haven't looked in a while, um, you have it in the kernel that lineage ships. You don't need to go to XDA and flash some random kernel or something on, which is nice. Um, uh there's been a little talk about making a, uh, a built-in app for it, but I think more likely what's going to happen is that an Android open source project will simply be APIs to make a WireGuard tunnel so that um, uh, you can get a kernel accelerated WireGuard tunnel, not just from the official WireGuard app, but also from you know various uh, provider apps, service provider apps that um, you know say they're this VPN or that VPN, but underneath use WireGuard and um, then they can get WireGuard by using those new APIs. So I think that's most likely the direction we'll go in. Um, and then the official WireGuard app will simply be a, a little layer on top of that API that anyone can use um, uh, that will just have the usual feature set that people expect from the WireGuard app. Mm -hmm. And on uh, on consumer normal consumer hardware, does WireGuard pretty much run at wire speeds? Uh, I, I kind of suspect that that was the intention based on the name. <laughs> is it is it fast enough to be considered a wire speed? Um, yeah, for, for the most part, WireGuard will, will go at wire speed. Um, uh, put a lot of effort into performance tuning. Um, it's funny, I had never actually thought that about the name. It never occurred to me. Uh, <laughs> first time I've heard that, too. Uh, but, um, yeah, for, for the most part, WireGuard... Um, scales very well. It's multi-threaded by default. The crypto primitives it uses are fast. Uh, the programming is simple enough that there's not too much clutter in the way to slow it down. Um, uh, so, of course, things depend on the CPU, but generally, yeah, WireGuard is very fast. Has, has any of the big players started looking at doing a, a hardware acceleration for WireGuard? I, I, honestly, I don't even know what kind of hardware that would look like. Uh, I, you know, in some cases, we think of like uh, offloading things to the GPU. I, I honestly don't know if that makes sense or not. I'm just curious. So I've had some, some discussions like that. Um, so there already kind of is acceleration with WireGuard. Um, the stream cipher it uses is called ChaCha20, and mm -hmm. there are very efficient software implementations of that um, uh, that can be accelerated with technologies like uh, AVX, AVX2, AVX512. Um, we're on, on ARM. There are the, the vector extensions as well. Um, and this winds up getting terrific performance. Um, you wouldn't want to offload something like WireGuard to a GPU because of the latency involved. Um, but there has been talk on uh, people making uh, network interface cards that have uh, that have the crypto built into those and dedicated hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the intent of this are you know things like hundred gig or something, uh, where. You know, it, maybe it's not reasonable to have a CPU doing that, but you can make a dedicated chip. And um, uh, there's uh, there's a decent amount of uh, open source hardware implementations for for Chacha 20 and Poly 1 through 5. So uh, people are looking into that. Hopefully, there'll be uh, some news on that in the next year or two. Um, but I, I think for now, um, uh, Chacha 20, Poly 1 through 5 are really uh, uh, terrifically performing uh, primitives for a wide variety of hardware. It'll work on you know tiny MIPS routers uh, pretty fast, and it'll work on you know, fast servers and uh, with acceleration. So that, that, that's really scaling the, the the whole sector pretty well. Mm, yeah. Uh, and then one of the one of the things that you've built into this project from the beginning is kind of a, a emphasis on simplicity. I'm curious: is that 
come back to bite you anywhere? Are there any use cases where WireGuard just doesn't work? Somebody needs to do something really fancy with their their routing or you know uh, giving out IPs, and and the answer is, well, okay, you need to go use OpenVPN for that, or you need to go use IPsec for that. Is that come up? Um, sort of, but not not really with the conclusion that you've given. Um, <laughs> There are many things that WireGuard doesn't do, and sometimes the answer is like, don't do that, or design your network differently <laughs> because it's not a good thing to do. And you know, I, these are answers, but they're not always the most satisfying answers. Um, uh, but I think, fortunately, in a lot of cases, when WireGuard doesn't fit a certain network topology, for example, some people want layer two semantics, and WireGuard does layer three. Um, People wind up finding that um, doing it the WireGuard way winds up working better anyway. Um, or in other cases, WireGuard won't have uh, something built in by design, but the APIs are set up that that's something you can easily add on on top. Um, and and usually you can add that st stuff on top very easily with you know a shell script or some Python or uh, you know even a web page. People do things with WireGuard. Um, and, and this kind of modular infrastructure of, of having components separate, I think, winds up being preferable to a lot of people in the end. Um, so I, I think there hasn't been so much of a, oh, WireGuard doesn't do this. I'm going to go back to using OpenVPN or IPsec uh, to more of, ah, WireGuard gives me this building block. Now I can add these other things in a way that makes way more sense to me than where I'd use one of these bloated all-in-one solutions. Um, so I, I think that's worked out well in the end. Uh, so right before Doc takes it back, I, I think I have time for one more question. Uh, and this is something I like to ask a whole bunch of different projects. And that is, what's the strangest thing you've seen somebody do with this? I, 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 know, I know developers and I know people of my mindset and we do weird off the wall things with technology that people give us. And what's, what's something you've seen that's just surprised you and delighted you? Oh my, um... <laughs> People have done a lot of weird mesh stuff with, with WireGuard. Um, there have been some neat mesh projects I've seen where people are running it over uh, like custom radio protocols. Uh, so like not Wi-Fi, but people building their own like Nordic RF based things, um, trying to get WireGuard on there. That's been very cool to see. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I've seen it used in, uh, in CTFs, Capture the Flag tournaments in various ways, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, people setting up some really kind of bizarre security infrastructures there that are meant to be very secure, but also broken intentionally. Um, um, so I've seen people taking WireGuard and adding bugs to it as part of the CTF. <laughs> it's been interesting. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe we all think about that and have some better answers mm -hmm. for you. But all right. So, so I have uh, uh, one, because we're close to the end of the hour here, one uh, final question before that I have to let the audience know that we have a new thing here uh, at Twit. It's called Club Twit, uh, and it'll get you uh, on-demand podcasts ad-free, uh, plus a, a bonus feed to members-only Discord. Um, so all Twit shows ad-free. Uh, a, a bonus feed, the members only Discord. I, I highly advise you to go there and uh, and check it out. It's at twit.tv slash club twit. That's twit.tv slash club twit. It's an exciting new thing here. It's a really uh, a b a big uh, option for the show and for the whole network. Um, so I, I, I'm wondering, uh, I want to ask a funding question, you know. So so how is it funded and maintained? Is this your day job or is this your uh, side job? I'm assuming it's your full-time work, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on WireGuard full-time indeed. Um, and uh, this is possible essentially through donations. Um, there are a number of companies that, um, that sponsor the project um, that you know pay not just my bills, but a couple other developers doing various things and the project gets money to them. Um, and there's also lots of individual donors. Um, 
who have uh, you know, recurring contributions or one-off. Um, and, and you can see a list of that on wireguard.com slash donations. And basically, uh, this is how the project survives. It's not uh, particularly easy, um, but it also keeps us free of, uh, of having uh, overly commercial interests or pulling the project in uh, one way or another that would be uh, anti-user. I mean, we're really just kind of focused on doing the, the secure network tunnel correctly and uh, as our as our main goal and just getting the code out there, having it be super high quality. Um, and so, so the project has gone with this donation-based structure. Um, and so far it's worked. Um, you know, hopefully it'll keep working, but so far it's been okay. Well, that's fantastic. I, I, we, we always close with the uh, final four questions. Um, uh, the first of which, which you'll have to, have to answer briefly, is what um, are there any questions we haven't asked that you wish we had? We can work it in before we close. Um, yeah, sure. I guess there there was one um, one curious thing I thought I should bring up about the project. It's a little peculiar. Um, uh, maybe this gets us back into the weeds a bit much, but I'll put it out there, which is that... Um, the WireGuard project approaches protocol uh, development a little differently than protocol development has worked on the internet uh, so far. Um, uh, for most internet protocols, you have a committee that designs a protocol, publishes the spec, and then other people implement it in different ways. Um, but the result of this is that you get uh, implementation flaws, um, uh, lots of bugs, incompatibility, um, by, by separating these, uh, there have been lots of problems over the ages. And, and for a project like WireGuard that's really focused on security, um, we're considering WireGuard to be not just the protocol, but also the set of implementations that we produce according to the security principles we discussed, uh, John and I discussed earlier. Um, and I, this is a big sea change. And, um, uh, you know, it's 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 ruffled some feathers out there. People say, well, you know, I see there's a protocol. I'll just go implement it. And they implement it, and it leads to problems. Um, and then we come along and say, hey, you know, we'll work with the WireGuard project, and we'll get a proper implementation. Um, but I, this is definitely a, a curious peculiarity of the project. Uh, I think it's worth worth mentioning. It's something that hasn't really been, been dis discussed uh discussed much out there that WireGuard is really both about the protocol and about the implementations. And uh, part of the philosophy behind the project is that uh, these two things, protocol and implementation, uh, aren't separated in their execution. I mean, sure, on paper, you can you know write a spec and um, separate them formally, but in the execution, protocol and implementation really go hand in hand. That's a critical point. And it, it sounds to me like something that's a topic for another show or a panel or something. Um, a, a quick one that's our control question. Do you have anything to say about blockchain? Mm, not today. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That saves us time. Um, and, and finally, <laughs> that's maybe the best answer I've gotten. Um, uh, what's your favorite text editor and scripting language? Um, I use Vim. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's what I use. My fingers know it. Um, scripting language. Let's see. Uh, I don't know about a favorite scripting language. I mean, all scripting languages are kind of limited by virtue of being scripting, but they're all fast and efficient for their own purposes. So I find myself writing a lot of Bash, which is really a, a horrific language in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, I wind up writing things in Bash that really ought not to be written in Bash. Um, but if I can just get started writing something at my command prompt and then copy and paste the same thing into Vim and make it into a script, it's just so convenient that I wind up using it a lot, even though it's really uh, often not the best tool for the job. Uh, the 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 bear mark may help us get Brian Fox on the show. <laughs> That's one of the things that I've been trying to do. But this is that this is great. It's been really great having you on, Jason. This has been a wonderful hour. Thanks for really having me. I appreciate having you here. 
Thanks. So, so Jonathan, how'd that, uh, how'd that go for you? You had yeah, some great I, questions, I thought. Oh, I, I always enjoyed getting to talk to you, Jason. Uh, I've, I've followed, I've followed WireGuard for a long time now. I, I got turned on to it by uh, Michael Larabelle over at Pharonix, I, I think was the first place that I saw it. And, and he was kind of one of the first people that, that started telling people about it. And I I worked with OpenVPN, and I've had the unfortunate, uh, the displeasure of having to support IPsec a few times too. And both of those protocols are, well, OpenVPN's not too bad, but they're, they are, they're unwieldy, and they're, they've got a lot of, uh, kind of historical cruft that has uh, clung on to those projects. Um, and so the idea of a, a whole new VPN that uh, learned the lessons from the past but was able to get rid of all of the cruft and use proven new cryptography, I mean, it's it was just a win from the start. And, uh, you know, I, I remember really getting excited when it finally landed in the Linux kernel and then getting excited again when, uh, or I think it happened first that it landed in, in OpenWRT in my router. Um, but just being able to deploy it and use it, it, it's, it really, it's a joy to work with. And, uh, again, it's always fun to talk to Jason about it because, you know, he's, he's, he's super sharp and he knows what he's talking about. He's also passionate about it. Well, and, uh, and one of the back channels, it was mentioned that, uh, uh, Linus called uh, uh, WireGuard a work of art, which I think is uh, is very consistent with this conversation we had. Clearly, Jason knows what he's doing and is has uh, and he reminds me a lot of Linus in in this sort of um, efficient and purposeful way he goes about things. But um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's 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 gratifying to see. And the, his last point about um, protocols being tied to implementations is interesting too because I seem to be involved lately in a lot of discussions where uh, something new is coming up and it's about choosing a protocol and I'm wondering I find myself wondering as some, a relative amateur whether or not a new one that's purpose built for this new thing whatever it is might be a better alternative uh, but having never written a protocol I have no idea but that's it's an interesting distinction yeah, I've gone through a little bit of that. One of the projects I was involved with, we kind of put ourselves in that same place where we wrote the protocol and we wrote all the implementations, and it caught uh, it, it caught the attention of one of these big conglomerate working groups, and they basically rewrote. <clears throat> uh, th there's a term I was going to use there, but uh, we, we try to keep uh, we try yeah. to keep the podcast family <laughs> friendly. Uh, we but don't they, allow they profanities here. Yeah. Right, right. There's a term that fits really well with what they did. Um, they uh, they rewrote the protocol and mangled it terribly and slapped the name that we were using on it. And and we tried we tried to get in there and, and help them fix it. And it just it didn't did not end well. So I applaud uh, I applaud WireGuard for being able to um, jealously protect that, that name and make sure that all the implementations are are sane at least. Yeah, yeah. So now it's time for um, uh, for plugs, and so let us have yours. I'm sure it's Hack a Day, which is just a great thing. So, oh yeah. So but what I, do you got? Yeah, I, I'll I'll mention again. Uh, I write. It runs every Friday morning. A security article. Um, it's basically the list of things that I found interesting that happened in security over the week. Uh, some of it, I, I think I've talked about WireGuard there before, uh, and in fact, I will. I will probably mention the FreeBSD debacle, or, or I may have mentioned it last week. I don't know. Um, it, it's we dive into the weeds sometimes and talk about protocol things. Uh, I've done a little, a little bit of independent research there. Every once in a while happens. You know, we dive into off the wall things like lock picking. It's it's really a smorgasbord of security minded things. Um, so every Friday morning, go and check that out. So okay, thanks so much. Um, I want to let you guys know that uh, next week we're scheduled to have uh, Jonathan Riddell to talk KDE Neon. So that should be a fun show, too. So thanks, everybody. It's been another Floss Weekly. We'll see you in a week, and hopefully I'll be back home by then. <laughs> so see you then.
Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are interested in checking out all things smart home and Internet of Things, then you should check out Smart Tech Today, the podcast I, Micah Sargent, do with my co-host Matthew Casanelli. It's all about the smart home and improving your automations. 